thanks Pete and thanks for sponsoring the session and thank you all for, um, for coming along and staying for our session. Um, what I want to do today is talk about four serious issues that are going to impact uh, the way in which you employ people into the future. There are those four serious issues. The first one is a, a new bridge that we have in the uh, bus industry and that's the, uh, the mining contracts that a lot of companies are now tendering for. It's the uh, ply in ply out circumstance. There's been a lot of inquiry into that of recent time and it's a, an issue that all employers need to consider. Uh, another issue that we're going to talk about today, another serious issue is the decasualization of the workforce. Um, and you probably know also that there is a major push towards secure employment um, and to basically do away with casuals and that's something that will impact on all of us as well. The other issues I want to talk about are gender equality, um, which is a, uh, a, at, at, at the forefront today uh, in industrial relations. And the final one is a, um, a a campaign which uh, BIC and APIA have been running for some time and that is in relation to um, uh, public transport being declared an essential service. So they are four very serious topics I am going to talk to you about late in the afternoon on the second day of, the, um, uh, of, this, uh, of this conference. But what I can assure you is that is the last time I am going to be serious about those four subjects from here on in until we leave, we are going to entertain you and hopefully um, we will have a situation where you will be able to understand the nuances of this new environment and at the same time enjoy yourself. And we are going to do that by me generally taking the mickey out of uh, the panel. What I am going to do is take you to a world in 2019 and can I say the world in 2019 is a far greater possibility than having um, a uh, driverless bus pick your kids up from school as David suggested earlier on in the day. The chances of the things happening that I'm about to present to you uh, are fairly good. How did that happen without me touching it? That's the thing. Um, I want to take you to the year 2019. And as you can see from that slide, in 2019, and it's surprising what you can get from Google. Google actually acts as a uh, crystal ball as well. There's going to be a World Cup cricket uh, uh, held in the UK. There's going to be a Rugby World Cup held in Japan, Hong Kong and Singapore. Um, I put the Bangladesh Navy having commissioned its first set of submarines because that sounded to me like something that was pretty far-fetched. Um, British troops leaving Germany having been stationed there since the war probably is, is not far-fetched. And the last one's quite exciting that NASA will land a crew of uh, four to six on the moon as part of its defunct Orion program. Apparently they have a defunct Orion program which isn't defunct and that they are preparing to land four to six people on the moon in 2019. So that's fairly exciting. The 2019 I'm going to present to you, however, is a circumstance in 2019 where there's been a federal election. Uh, the Honourable Tania Plibersek is now the second female Prime Minister of our country. Um, unfortunately, Malcolm Turnbull lost in Wentworth to the Greens, so he lost uh, the leadership of the now Liberal National op Opposition. Uh, and Scott Morrison is the leader. The ALP went to an election with a platform to repeal the Essential Services Act, which I'll tell you about. They've also gone into a, um, uh, a new act called the Gender Equality and Intersex Status Discrimination Act. Um, what that effectively means, and I'll explain it to you, is that gender no longer becomes an issue in employment. Uh, what intersex status means, that if you actually change your sex, that's not an issue for discrimination either. The Secure Employment Act I'll tell you about and I've already suggested on the uh, Secure Employment and I just put the Paid Parental Leave Act in because everybody puts the Paid Parental Leave Act into their politics so that's there. 
Now these are, these are our uh, panel and I'll introduce them in their current uh, status and that first one on the top left is Geoffrey Ferris. And Jeffrey's the Group Operations Manager for the Bus Lines Group. As you know, they run uh, country services in New South Wales. They're a large New South Wales-based operation. Um, on that uh, bottom left uh, is Sam Lucas, who you also know. He's the Managing Director of Warrnambool Bus Lines and uh, uh, Bus Link Sunraysia. Uh, in the middle is Pete. As he told you, he's a Senior, com senior Commercial um, law partner at Piper Alderman. On the top right uh, is Kylie Henningsen. Kylie is the General Manager of Human Resources and Industrial Relations at Greyhound Australia. Um, Kylie's got a very interesting job because Greyhound run a lot of the uh, mining contracts, more particularly out in the Pilbara. So uh, Kylie dons the uh, mining gear and the hard hat and the boots and she gets out there into the Pilbara, lives in the Dongers and negotiates with with uh, Bechtel and Chevron for uh, industrial relations uh, um, enterprise agreements. So she's at the cold pace of the fly in, fly out. And we also have the managing director of uh, Telford's um, and uh, uh, Scott is uh, the uh, owner of the Telford's bus. Scott Dunn, the owner of the Telford's bus, as you saw. So that's our, uh, our panel of five. Could you give them a uh, warm welcome? They've all got thick skins, I hope, because this is what they are in 2019. Peter's decided to join the Liberal Party. He hated Clive Palmer. In 2016, he ran for the seat of Fairfax, which is a Queensland seat, and he won that seat in 2016. He was prepared to do the dirty on Malcolm Turnbull and support Scott Morrison, and he was rewarded when Scott Morrison became the leader and he's now the Shadow Minister for Employment. So Peter's the one that's going to give the uh, opposition's position in relation to employment law. Geoffrey, unfortunately, has had a fallout with the bus lines group and the owners and the executive directors and everyone are just down here at this table. He's had a fallout. Unfortunately, Geoffrey fell asleep at the wheel of a bus that he was driving and hit a tree. He was terminated. Scott Dunn from Telford's Bus Lines employed him. Until today, Scott didn't know that Geoffrey fell asleep at the wheel. He just employed him because he thought he had experience. There were a lot of still knocks packets in the buses that started to worry Scott, but until today, Scott didn't know that was the situation. Geoffrey's a TPI, he's on a pension, the tree did a lot of damage, but he's able to work partially as a school bus driver, a casual school bus driver who's on the pension, he supplements his pension uh, by driving school buses. Scott's now running deregulated services, Scott is from the UK where the services are deregulated. Um, the um, New South Wales government had a turnaround and they decided to deregulate all rural services by 2019. Scott saw that as an opportunity for his company and so he started Telford's bus lines and he now runs a lot of country operations and that's why he's got Geoffrey on board. Kylie on the other hand was headbutted, head, head headhunted by Bechtel to uh, manage the LNG Wheatstone mining project so now she doesn't work for Greyhound anymore, she works for Bechtel that runs the whole mine, so she's on top of this employment issue. Sam, on the other hand, as you know, uh, is now the sole owner of Warrnambool Bus Lines. We don't have enough time to talk about how he acquired the entire business, but it was acrimonious and there was a lot of litigation. But he's now the owner of Warrnambool Bus Lines, having bought out all the family's interests. He has followed his father's passions, however, and he's now the newly crowned chairperson of the Bus Industry Confederation. Congratulations, Scott. He also followed his father's passion for Labor politics, and he became the Labor Mayor of Warrnambool, his hometown. So that's our panellists. So when I'm talking to our panellists, I'm talking to them only in the terms of their 2019 persona. The first thing I want to talk about is the Secured Employment Bill. This is a bill that the Labor government is introducing which is going to do this. 
It's going to permit only 10% of your uh, workforce to be casuals. Um, and a casual can only work a maximum of 10 hours. After that, you're no longer a casual. You no longer get the benefit of the loading. You, you become either a permanent part-time employee or, or you become, uh, and you're guaranteed 20 hours uh, a week or you become a permanent. Included in that is the increase to 12% superannuation, which is payable to casuals and permanents. So this is the first hypothetical environment that we're looking at in the circumstances. And my first question is to Geoffrey. Now, as a casual school bus driver, Jeff, um, you only want to work eight to 10 hours a week. You've got your pension. You can't supplement it anymore because you really rely on the free medical that being on the pension gives you because you have a lot of medical bills, et cetera, because of the accident. Um, what, what do you think about the concerns about the decasualisation of the workforce? Thank you, Mr. McDonald. Um, we, I'm very concerned that there is assumption that everybody wants to work a lot of hours a week. So we, some of us can't, unfortunately, <coughs> due to the circumstances inflicted on us by the community, uh, have suffered some uh, tragedy early in our life and we can no longer work full time. And so we should be allowed to retain our right to, uh, to work a, a number of hours that suits us. And uh, this idea that everybody has to work 20 plus hours a week is just not, uh, not what uh, myself and many of my colleagues in the, my bus depot uh, wish, to, uh, wish to have to abide with. And so we, we do deserve to, uh, to be able to hold a job. It may only be for 10 hours a week, but we want to become and want to be, continue to be valuable parts of our uh, business. Scott, in a deregulated environment like you had in the UK and certainly as you've adopted out in Australia with Telford's where the preference appears to be to employ casuals um, and provide them with, you know, hours of up to 38, 40 hours a week, um, how would the decasualisation of the workforce impact on that deregulated environment and those operators that sought to employ casuals only as opposed to permanents? Yeah, I mean, generally just because of the geography of Australia, um, generally you get a lot of peak time and um, school children movement. So casual workforce is essential part to it. In the UK, it's more consistent. So you get more 364 days a year work where drivers do full rosters. Um, obviously, without the casual workforce, you have a lot of peaks and you've got a lot of troughs when s schools are closed, which means basically you've got a lot of staff doing nothing. I mean, the things we've tried to do is um, encourage everybody to take the holidays during school time, but it doesn't quite work, which has increased a lot of our running costs. Um, where possibly a deregulated market worked prior to this new, this new legislation, it now makes it inefficient because we've got no way of passing them additional costs on. Mm. And, and Kylie, in relation to the fly in, fly out, it's very difficult in the mining industry to provide permanent work on a permanent basis when they're coming from different locations. Um, how, how does Bechtel employ their staff and how would they deal with something like this circumstance? The, the majority of the, the contracts that go out to subcontractors mean that people need to be employed on a project term basis rather than a casual basis. So they're employed for the life of the contract or until the, the staffing needs ramp up and ramp down depending on the demand. So it's more like a, a formal casual employment relationship, but they actually get annual leave and sick leave instead. The issue with having casual employment on those sites is that it is consistent and regular work for a period of time. Okay. And, and Sammy, you're a school bus operator in various respects, and in many ways your drivers are just working 20 hours a, a week, sometimes, sometimes less. How would your drivers take it if they were required to go on permanent part-time and obviously get holidays uh, when the school holidays are on rather than just take the loadings. How would that impact on the... Yeah, our uh, workforce is uh, a lot like uh, Jeffrey's. You um, uh, don't want to uh, necessarily work or have permanent um, employment status. They want to be able to work when they need to work and take the time when they need it. So. Uh, in our, in our business, uh, that would have a, a real effect on our, uh, on our employees. 
So, Pete, you're the um, employment minister. You've heard um, the uh, the responses from the various um, parties. Um, how does the uh, opposition plan to oppose this bill? Vehemently opposed. For the simple reason, because you'd be just going backwards and um, what you've outlined is simply a maximisation of employees in terms of remuneration, which is not necessarily what the workforce is wanting. You want flexibility and you also want an arrangement where there's a balance between the employer and the employee. So we, as the opposition, would be uh, opposing that. Well, Sam, as um, chairman of the Bus Industry Confederation and taking... Obvi obviously, there was nobody else left. ...taking such a role as you do, um, what the unions are arguing and what the uh, government are arguing is that people are actually looking for secure employment. People are actually looking for, um, uh, you know, security in the way in which they do their... are able to get loans, housing loans, etc. and they, they're looking at... They're looking at a much better basis than being employed by the hour, um, you know, and getting the loading and not having that long-term security. Is it unreasonable for them to uh, really want to have full-time employment? And should should we as an industry be supporting that process? Yeah, I think um, a lot of Australians expect, would have an expectation of ongoing employment and would like the security of, uh, of, having, uh, of having those provisions. Uh, and I think in the main, the bus industry does offer security to its employees and, and offers them uh, good rates of pay and, uh, and good employment. But at the same time, our businesses and our industry needs to have the flexibility to be able to um, uh, keep uh, employees on an hour-by-hour -hour engagement basis so that we can do the work that we need to do for our, for our clients. Thanks. The next item I want to talk about is essential services and the essential services bill or act was passed by the Liberal government, by the Turnbull government in 2017. In 2016, the, um, you may recall, the, um, uh, the Aussie rules grand final had to be cancelled because the trains, the trams and the buses in um, in Melbourne went on strike and there was no way that people could get to the ground so the AFL made the decision to cancel the, um, the game. Um, in 2017 the same thing happened for the Boxing Day tests uh, and that was also cancelled and as a consequence there was such a hue and outcry from the Victorians particularly um, that the government of the day forced through the Essential Services Act which is very similar to uh, what they have in Singapore. In Singapore, they have a, uh, what they call a temporary criminal code. It was introduced in 1955. And one of the uh, issues in that temporary criminal code was that um, the government had the power to um, place limitations on when strike action would be taken. And in Singapore, you have to give 14 days notice of a strike. Um, and in addition to that, you have to give notice as to how you are going to provide minimum services to, uh, to the effect that you can actually continue to carry on the uh, services of your city. I mean, think about it. We've, we've heard a lot about transport in Singapore over the last two days. If the public transport system shut down here, the city would shut down. Um, and this has happened in other areas of the, um, uh, of the world. Uh, Bic has been an advocate for this and... Um, uh, Pete was one of the initiators uh, in 2017 for this, uh, this act. Obviously, the Labor Party, when they got into government, are seeking to repeal it because they say this interferes with the freedom of association and the right to strike, which is an international right provided through the International Labor Organization. So the, the, the actual provision that applies at the moment under the Essential Services Act is that in relation to public transport, you can't go on strike unless it's been approved by the minister and the minister will only approve it in circumstances where minimum services have been, um, uh, have been adhered to. So, Pete, this is your act. Uh, how are you going to stave off the, uh, the uh, government's attempts to repeal it? Well, I think we've got to just use the campaign uh, anecdotally. We've got to go back and see that what happened 
particularly in respect to some operators, I think in 2013, when the Trans Australia Group in the Sunshine Coast was badly affected by uh, striking bus drivers for a dispute that went over six months. Got little sympathy from the government uh, regulator at the time. Um, was absolutely scorned by the community because they couldn't provide the services, yet the government wouldn't help. And regrettably, the Fair Work Act, after a number of applications, uh, various commissioners refused to deem that as a uh, essential service. Um, there's also others, Southern Cross in um, Sydney when there was a transition of a new operator. Um, so regrettably, the Fair Work Act at that time was limited and the commissioners took the view that you had to be essentially an ambulance to be essential service. So going forward, it was our view that public transport was an essential service based on other jurisdictions. And therefore, in terms of people getting to work or people having no other means, or the, the needy not having any um, um, actual funds to actually use taxis and others. So I think a campaign would have to be um, embellished to ensure that the public saw what that act being repealed would in fact go back into the dark days of how the operators and the community would be um, greatly maligned. Geoffrey, you're a member of the TWU and you've become quite militant since you've gone to Telford's bus lines. Um, there has been some suggestion it was the knock on the head when uh, the bus hit the tree, but you know, um, you're quite militant about this and you feel very strongly about the uh, right to, uh, to strike. So what do you say about Pete's uh, um, defence of, the, uh, of the act? Mr McDonald, I was only discussing this the other day with our leader, Dame Tanya Plimacy, who took the dame sh ship or whatever it is uh, when she became Prime Minister. Um, why did we not have the right to strike? Here I am working my proverbial butt off for 10 hours a week and you're telling me now I can't strike and put my point across to the public. Um, just because I drive buses, I'm not allowed to voice uh, our downtrodden uh, existence of only being able to work 10 hours a week. You know, I probably should be paid for 40, but only work 10, and the others shouldn't count in part of my tax income. But um, my comrades and myself do believe we do have the right to strike, and it's a God-given right to every good labour-fearing person that they have the right to strike, and just because we drive buses, we shouldn't be penalised for that. Under that uh, Singapore Temporary Criminal Code, it was temporary, it was brought in in 1955 on a temporary basis, so I think in probably 2155 it'll be removed. Um, the, um, the Minister has the right to detain people indefinitely, so I'd just be careful what you're saying, Geoffrey. Um, so, look... I've been threatened by bigger people than you. No, okay, that's good. Uh, so, Sammy, you understand and you know the history of, of BIC and how it's supported the concept of the essential service and that we think public transport is an essential service, but being the good labour man that you are and, you know, there is a bit of a connection there, I mean, how do you reconcile BIC's position seeking the, for it to be an essential service and your social values? As a, uh, as a Labor Mayor of Warrnambool, I heartily reject this offensive piece of uh, legislation. I think it's just another typical liberal ploy to, uh, to shift all of the, uh, the eggs and all of the bargaining into the employers, um, into the uh, favour of the employer. And uh, I'm, I'm very, very happy that Dame Plibersek is uh, choosing to repeal the Act and uh, to reinstate the Buddha given rights of, uh, of every worker to uh, leverage uh, strike action to, uh, to get a fair outcome from their employers. But as chairman of BIC, I uh, am thoroughly horrified <laughs> that this uh, Labor government led by Tanya Plibersek would be thinking of uh, repealing a sensible act which ensures that the vital service of uh, public transport conti can, can continue regardless of the money-grubbing actions of a corrupt union movement. Yeah, thanks, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see that coming. Uh, so, Kylie, um, how does Bechtel deal with strikes out there? You know, do you punish the, uh, the bus operator if, um, if strikes occur and do they get fined, etc.? Um, 
so a, a delay in production for us one day is about $18 million. So our expectation is that the subcontractor would have that covered, which means if they have 50 employees who are going to go on strike, we would expect them to have 50 drivers sitting next to them ready to drive. So it's not a force majeure in their contracts, for instance? It is not a force majeure in their contracts. We'd also expect them to lock everyone out. Okay. So, Scotty, um, David Cameron, um, your fearless leader in the UK, went to the last election with uh, proposals to uh, tighten up strike action because of the threats of uh, strikes within the underground. Um, do you see, where do you sit in relation to this concept of, of, of balancing the right to freedom of association with the ability of public transport to be a, uh, an essential service and to continue to run despite the requirement or the desire to have uh, that right of uh, association? Where do you sit? Um, well, obviously, as the managing director of uh, Telford, um, I'm obviously a capitalist, so I'm looking to grow a business. I'm always going to be um, want to support public transport, and I believe the good work that all the operators have done over the f last few years of raising the profile of public transport, um, something like an act like this could just take us back years. Um, People forget that we're a public service, we're there to offer service to give people uh, social inclusion to hospitals, uh, jobs, and um, this will just, like I say, take us backwards. Okay. Well, I want to move on to the changing workplace and I want to move on to gender equality. Um, I'm sure you know what gender equality is and um, in our workplace, in our workplace uh, in 2019, uh, there has been a major push towards ensuring that all those who want to work are able to work and recognising the fact that, particularly in the case of women who have children, etc., that they have the ability to come back into the workforce. So this Gender Identity and Intersex Status Discrimination Act that's proposed by the uh, Labor government in 2019 does a number of things. It ensures that it is a discriminatory um, circumstance if you prevent, for instance, either a female or a transgender person or an intergender person who somebody, these are the new terminologies that exist, an intergender person being somebody that's had a sex change, for instance, uh, prevent them from having a job and don't provide them with the same circumstances for, uh, for work. In addition to that, the Act will um, add certain things to strengthen that ability for all persons to be able to work in the workforce. And there will be a recognition that, for instance, women or people, same-sex marriages who have children or adopt children, are able to come back into the workforce and have lesser work. So if they're working uh, five days a week, they'll now be able to work as permanent part-time three days a week uh, for a period of up to two years to enable them to raise their children, um, get them to school and then come back to work in, um, in the, uh, the full work environment. In addition to that, there, the proposal in the bill is to add an extra 2% um, to uh, superannuation for uh, those uh, persons in the circumstances to get them back to work as further encouragement to bridge the gap between the pay rates between males and females. That's the new workplace that's uh, existing in um, 2019 and that's the proposal for uh, for uh, the workplace uh, in 2019. So I want to put to the panel a circumstance where they are seeking to employ um, two drivers. They're seeking to employ two drivers. Now one of those drivers, one of those drivers is a male with no experience. A male with no experience. The second person who's gone for the job is a female with five years of experience who's just got engaged and is looking forward to raising a family but is also looking forward to starting work uh, with, uh, with the company. The third person is a female who was a male um, who's had five years experience you got the picture? Now a female, was a male, five years experience. And the fourth one 
is a mechanic who does a lot of driving on a 457 visa. Now, you didn't bring the person out on the 457 visa. They just didn't like their previous job, so they fronted up to you for a job. So there's four. There's four. Everyone got it? Now, the place where that person's gone for the job is Telford's bus lines. So, Scotty, you clear in your head who the four are. I want to know which two you employ and why. And I also want to know why you didn't employ the other two. You've got 30 <laughs> seconds to answer this question no, or you I self destruct. <laughs> I'll give you a cop out answer actually. So uh, I'd, I'd go to our HR department and I'd say, <laughs> end of the day, you've got to treat them all equal. And you've got to, I suppose, they'll have a formal interview. They'll get reference check, driver assessment, and we'd employ the ones that the ability to drive safely in an efficient manner with the best customer skills. Doesn't it so concern you that the woman, within a very short period of time, might be coming to you having had her first child and um, said to you uh, that she now wants to, instead of doing her five-day shift, just do a three-day shift? Well, obviously, Mr. McDonald, you um, can't discriminate because of that, so obviously it wouldn't, no. I wouldn't like to think you would. No. I'm just saying definitely that doesn't not. concern you. No, 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 definitely not. So are you saying you'd have no trouble uh, employing the, um, the intergender person? Um, I wouldn't have a trouble. I suppose we need to consider the toilet arrangements a little bit more. But, um, well, I was going to ask, I was actually going to ask Geoffrey because Geoffrey will be working alongside of... Um, this person. Um, so let's assume the intergender person, nice looking girl, um, formerly a male. Jeffrey, uh, would you feel uncomfortable working alongside a, uh, an intergender person? Let me just say, Mr. McDonald, that my comrades and myself have discussed this in the meal room on several occasions. We believe number ones which should be selected in the job re advertised for the second driver. We would not be comfortable working with those sort of people. Okay? You've got to sit on the toilet seat. And there's things that happen that we wouldn't like feel comfortable doing after other people. Okay. okay. But we are very, very open to new things. <laughs> so, Kylie, out on the, uh, out on the Pilbury in Onslow, where it's very lonely sometimes, um, you've probably seen all of those types of employees. Um, uh, in those circumstances, who would you recommend for employment? The, the rules are pretty clear for that site. You have to have at least three years of driving experience. So you have people that have been locked out and been taken already. For the others, there's a, a range of testing that has to happen. So there's about five stages before someone can actually be employed on that site. And that includes different kinds of medicals. It includes different kinds of driving assessments. And that's how the decision will be made. So you'd have no trouble employing the uh, female, notwithstanding that she might, in a short period of time, uh, have to, um, uh, you know, have to, you know, work shorter hours because she's had the children, etc. One of the conditions of employment on that site is that you're actually available to work whatever your swing is. So the guys at the moment are on a 28/7. If we move to non-compression rosters, they'll be on three weeks on, three weeks off. It's a requirement of the role. What about the intergender person? Uh, that person's got five years' experience. Would they, would the, how would the minors feel about um, that sort of circumstance? I'm not sure how they would know. Well, gee, they, um, <laughs> gee, <laughs> I don't know. Do they talk? Uh, do they talk out there? I don't know what happens out there. You know, you've been out there, not me. I, I've just read the books. <laughs> I don't know that it would be viewed that strangely out there. They're, a, um, a very act they're actually a very inclusive culture. So once people go to those sites and stay in those sites for a while, their sense of community is actually quite astounding. Yeah. So Sam, you've already got a couple of intergender uh, people working for you at Warrnambool Bus Lines. So that obviously is not gonna be a problem for you because that appears to be one of your preferred um, employment routes. But um, of those four, who would you employ? Uh, firstly, uh, we would take the uh, 457 mechanic. Uh, regional areas mechanics are rare as hen's teeth and uh, we're pretty confident that uh, regardless of driving experience, we'd be able to get them up to, uh, to where they needed to be there. Uh, secondly, as a, as a condition, as part of the sale of the business, uh, we would build an agreement to the, the uh, assisting uh, my father in any way 
possible to uh, get on with the next stage of his life. So the uh, second spot would be sign up there uh, with the cha uh, transgender. Well, I, I didn't say when you started employing the transgender. I just assumed you did it when your dad was the general manager of the uh, of the company, and you just followed like father, like son. So that's how I worked out. Uh, so, Pete, all in all, in this changing workplace, um, where there is a stated need to ensure that we have as diverse a workplace as possible, where society is certainly moving that way for that, um, how do you see the debate going on, on this bill, bill in Parliament? Um, is it the sort of thing that the Conservatives, you know, the Cory Bernardis and the Tony Abbotts of your party would probably have some concern with, but the more moderate members of your party not have as much concern with? Um, well, what's your thoughts on that? I, I think the track record was that um, Opposition Leader uh, Morrison has clearly directed uh, that the position of gender, etc., has to be looked at in a far more moderate way as opposed to the Peter Credlin-led style. Um, consequently, um, we have now put it in review. So we've got it into a committee looking at how we can deal with various people, particularly like um, Mr. Lucas and the effect of what would happen and how would that um, affect his business. But certainly I think the moderation would be that we would uh, be trying to be accepting that type of workforce. Okay. Uh, what I forgot to mention was that um, the um, Plibersec government doesn't have the majority in the Senate. Um, that goes to the Lambie party. Jackie Lambie has formed a party. It's called Lambie's Larrikins, and they've got uh, five members in the Senate. And the good thing from the Essential Services Bill is that she just loves a Boxing Day test, so um, there's no way that uh, that repeal of the Essential Services Bill will go through. But uh, she was also very supportive of the same-sex um, uh, marriage uh, act and there were a couple of liberals uh, who didn't vote in favour of same-sex marriage. So Pete, the question I want to ask you is uh, how did you vote on same-sex marriage? I put my vote in the envelope and put it in the ballot box. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you vote against it, did you? Is that what happened? Um, look, I want to just move on to the fly-in, fly-out. Um, circumstances because this um, uh, this was introduced by the uh, Liberal Coalition but if you if you've been mindful of the history of this there has been um, a lot of suicides in the mining camps and um, there have been a number of reports came out in the uh, from 2015 onwards particularly from the Western Australian government and the Queensland government where obviously most of the mining uh, takes place and the biggest issue is the rostering and the um, accommodation for the families and the proposal for the, the uh, mental, mental Health Fly In Fly Out Act is that the, the rosters will change completely. Um, so you'll have three weeks on and three weeks off. Um, you'll have eight weeks annual leave. Um, you'll be, you'll, it'll be a requirement that you go back to the same accommodation, um, that you get paid a minimum of 10 hours uh, a day and that you're allowed to bring your families uh, to the camps at least three times a year. This is to try to provide in those isolated areas some sort of humanity for the, uh, the miners, whether they're miners or whether they're uh, bus drivers employed by our members uh, who are driving in and out. Um, and I want to talk to uh, Kylie primarily about the concept of the fly-in, fly-out and and I'm, I'm sure you're aware of this push to change this rostering structure and I just thought I'd get your comments on it and what you felt about that. Well, it, it actually creates a certain level of havoc because at the moment with the guys, and particularly the busing providers at the Wheatstone site, they work a four-on-one roster, which means that at any given point in time, you have a fifth of your workforce at home for a week and you're paying them to be at home for a week. If you move to something that looks like a three-on and three-off, you're effectively paying to have half of your workforce at home for three weeks at a time. So the impact that that has on the busing subcontractors up there is absolutely phenomenal, especially in terms of how they then run an efficient busing service and how they tender in a way that makes them actually affordable in any way, shape or form to be there. 
The other critical thing is that 10 hours a day means that the downtime that drivers have is massive. You would have at least four or five hours a day of non-productive work time and the cleanest fleet of buses that you've ever seen. Because drivers really only work to drive the workforce to work in the morning, to pick them up at night and to do the same thing with night shifts. They also take people <coughs> to the airport and back. So on a normal day, an average bus driver on one of these sites maybe works four hours. And then they get paid to go to the gym, have lunch, swim in the pool, play footy, and wait around just in case we need them for something else. But the cost impact of changing the rostering, I mean, at the moment, rostering is tight. You know, you, mm -hmm. you, employ, you employ them as contracted employers. Mm -hmm. They go into the camps for, say, four, four weeks, then they have a week off yep. on, on that contract basis, then they're back again the next week. If it became a three by three or there have been a number of enterprise agreements starting to negotiate with the CFMEU where they're mm -hmm. seeking to spread out the, the, the gap in the rostering, that's going to have a cost impact, isn't it? Uh, who bears that cost impact? Not Bechtel. No, but I, I guess the point is that the cost impact of that's going to flow through to the cost of the you know, crude ore or whatever they're mining to the, uh, to the amount of profitability that the, uh, opera, the bus operator who's running to the mines is going to have it's, it's you're quite right chevron or bechtel aren't going to mm. wear it but who's going to wear it somebody's got to wear that cost the the thing that we're seeing more and more of especially through the, the bowen basin region and at wheatstone is that all of the big contractors up there are looking at efficiencies and looking at ways to cost out so the the people who i guess are wearing the costs are the the busing providers who are going in are having lower and lower margins and certainly that the bus drivers will not be enjoying the level of wages that they are at the moment so the guys on those sites have inflated wages. All of the workers on those sites have heavily inflated wages. They won't be able to do that if they move to these lower compression rosters. Mm. You won't be paying them to be fly-fly workers. You'll be paying them to work half a year. Okay. So, Scotty, uh, in line with your expansionist uh, policy, since you've come to Australia, you're looking to expand and, um, uh, you know, take over as many bus operations as you can in Australia. You've looked at some of these mining contracts and tendered for them. So far, you you haven't been able to succeed in winning one. Um, does it concern you, this change of roster, how that might impact on your ability to actually win tenders in the future? Yeah, obviously, um, this just makes the, um, the resource sector harder to, um, well, firstly, it's not going to affect us drivers who were paid less to do this type of work, which means that it's harder to actually get drivers if you did win a contract. It's no longer lucrative because they can't generate the amount of income they need to to make it worthwhile to be on site for three weeks. Um, so the drivers lose out. And I suppose secondly, ultimately, um, somebody does have to pay. So whether it's um, the bus operators, but I, I don't believe that's the case because a lot of these operators can't afford to run at these margins. No. So ultimately, the, um, the resource sector pays which means basically prices go up and Australia becomes even more uncompetitive on a global scale. Mm. So, Scotty, given that, you know, we've talked about a lot of mental problems with drivers, you know, going out to those mining camps, if you were successful in, um, in winning one of the tenders, do you see that there's a role for Jeffrey out there, given that you wouldn't have to worry about him developing any mental problems because they're already there, so... <laughs> would that would you see Jeffrey our future for Jeffrey out there and the possibly because he can get paid for doing a, get paid 40 hours for doing 10 hours a week mm. so there's probably like that sort of role and uh, the other positive thing is there aren't many trees for him to run into either no, out there no, no. in fact there's nothing to run into he can just drive off the side of the road and no problem mr mcdonald if i could add that i think it's only right these drivers get paid 10 hours a day you know you see the likes of these bus barons from the southern states running around in red jackets because they can afford it. And so we've got people like John King who make an enormous amount of money out of these mining contracts and should only be right that they share it with their drivers. I think that's a good idea. So, Sam, do you ever see the expansion of Warrnambool uh, into the mining industry? Do you ever see that as a role that uh, uh, could occur? You've, you've spread your wings um, across the country. Yeah, we, uh, in this modern... Uh, current period that we're living in, the, the now, in 2019, we've been keeping a very close eye on the resource sector and we've certainly seen that the work across the, uh, across the board has, has really fallen off the end of a cliff. This, um, 
Uh, this Act, whilst it was uh, well intended when it was introduced by the Liberal Government, has made Australia's resource sector so uh, uncompetitive that uh, projects are no longer going ahead as they were. So the, the work just really isn't there. And, and uh, you know, when you have to get to a stage where you're uh, employing, you know, uh, mentally addled drivers who uh, are running into trees and happen to find spots to put them up in the Pilbara, I think, you know, that speaks volumes. And so we've really decided to, to stay away from that work because it's just not, there's no money in it for us. So, Pete, in your role as Minister for Employment, have you been out to one of these mining towns? Oh, no. Not interested. <laughs> not interested. <laughs> would, would you be interested in me organising with Kylie, you know, who heads up Bechtel to get you out there for a few photo shots? You know, politicians you need good photo opportunities. You could, you could have a photo opportunity yeah, wonderful. with Geoffrey out there because he'll be out there. Supporting the mentally ill, yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, look, uh, what we've tried to do over this last 40 minutes or so is provide you with a little bit of an insight into where industrial relations is heading over the next, um, uh, you know, three to four years and try to provide it in some sort of an interesting way uh, and enjoy this last um, um, session uh, for the evening. So could I ask that you thank Geoffrey and Scott and Kylie and Sam and Pete for being good scouts. Thanks, guys. And, and in conclusion, I would like to uh, thank Pete and Piper Alderman for sponsoring this session and obviously invite all the delegates to the Valvoline Happy Hour in the Piano Bar and remind them that the Scania dinner starts at 7 o'clock in this same room. So we'll see you all there. Thanks for coming today and uh, we hope you enjoy the evening. Thanks so much.